Thank you very much. Uh, once again, your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, you are welcome. May I now invite the Chairman of the Organizing Committee, Professor Mamel Kuramadufu, to come and give his opening remarks. Prof, you are welcome.
the vice chancellor of the state university other visiting vice chancellors principal officers of the university members of the university senate special guests uh, including his royal highness the emir of nyamaltu and other royal guests the professor halima abba who has been inaugurated this afternoon my colleagues uh, lecturers staff students uh, members of the press ladies and gentlemen good afternoon on behalf of the vice chancellor of the state university professor ali usman al nafati i would like to welcome everyone to this very important academic uh, occasion uh, that is the professorial inauguration the sixth in the series professorial inauguration is a universal tradition by universities where newly appointed or appointed or promoted uh, professors give account of their academic journey including postulations into the future of their chosen area of specialization today we have professor halima muhammad abba from the department of botany in the faculty of science she has made history in a number of ways she is the first female professor in the university to be inaugurated she is she is also the first professor from the faculty of science also to be inaugurated so uh maybe the list goes on she is also the first to attract a royal delegation uh to the uh, this kind of occasion so i therefore now have the honor and privilege to invite the vice chancellor to please come forward and make his remarks before we go into the main inauguration lecture itself Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir. Members of the University Governing Council present here, principal officers of the university, our royal fathers our royal fathers present here professors heads of departments deans directors invited guests my dear students and of course the inaugural lecturer professor halima mohammed abba ladies and gentlemen good evening I'm highly delighted this evening to welcome you all to this a very important inaugural lecture important in the sense we are upholding the tradition of universities by holding regularly these inaugural lectures for obvious reasons let them be a source of information let them also be a source of uh, education and also a source of motivation for the young ones that are coming behind a lot of knowledge sometimes is being produced and kept in the universities and this is one of the mediums upon which this information can go to the public in the inaugural lecture is the professor newly 
from what our point of reference are, to come and tell the world what he or she has achieved in the academia. And therefore, a lot of knowledge, research, findings, discoveries, and so many things sometimes are made available to the public. Like the chairman of the inaugural lecture committee in the FETF. Yes, she is the first female in this university to promote the rank of professor and also the first female to be given an inaugural lecture. So it makes a lot of, a lot of uh, incentive and a lot of motivation for our young wives, especially for the female ones. And very soon we hope to see more of them coming to deliver such lectures. I would like to take so much of your time, ladies and gentlemen. I welcome you all, and I hope you're going to listen and then take, have a take home uh, information from what the inaugural lecture I want to tell us this evening. Thank you, and good evening. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, that's the Vice Chancellor of the State University, Professor Aliu Suman El Nafati. Prof, you are welcome. Uh, now it's my honor and pleasure to invite both the inaugural lecturer and the university orator. You come together, you stand here, the inaugural lecturer, while you, the university orator, will be here where I'm standing, and then give her a citation. You are welcome. Come over, both of The Vice Chancellor of Bombay State University, Professor Ali Usman El Nafati, Officer of the Federal Republic. Members of the University Governing Council, the Deputy Vice Chancellors, Administration and Academic, the Registrar of the University, the University Liberia, the University Bosa. Provosts, deans, and directors, heads of academic departments, distinguished professors, and other university senate members, His Royal Highness Al Haji Dr. Abakar Ali, FCNA Emir of Yamalti, other staff of the university. Representative of the Vice Chancellor of Federal University of Kashari, Professor Umar Burama, our dear postgraduate and undergraduate students here present, ladies and gentlemen, standing on the permission of the Vice Chancellor, I have the singular honor and privilege to render the citation on Professor Halima Muhammad Abba on the historic occasion of her inauguration as a professor of this beautiful university. <laughs> professor Halima Muhammad Abba was born on the 25th of November 1965 in Jos Plateau State to the family of Alaji Muhammadu Gwani Abba, Amala Masalamatu Muhammadu Gwani Abba from Shinga, Nyamal Tudeba local government area of Bombay State. Her educational journey began at the Yerwa Central Primary School, Meduguri, from 1970 to 1977, followed by the Federal Government College, Meduguri, where she had her secondary education from 1977 to 1981. In 1982, she pursued the Bachelor of Science degree in Botany at the University of Meduguri, graduating in 1987. Subsequently, she earned a secondary school from between 1987 to 1988. After her NYSC, Professor Alima was posted by the test Doma, where she worked until 1998. While at Doma in 1992, she pursued the master's degree in plant morphology 
and physiology at the University of Medukuri, successfully completing in 1998. She later redeployed her services to Kashim Ibrahim College of Education, Medukuri, where she worked from 1998 to 2005. During this period, she was completing a postgraduate, including serving as the coordinator of the registration committee in the period 2012 to 2014. She also took on supervisory roles in both JAM and IDMB examinations. Her pursuit of knowledge led her, led her to enroll into the PhD program in Botany at ATB Ubauchi in 2007. She became a doctor of philosophy in 2014. Due to her young teacher's vocational training workshop 2016 to 2017, member information committee of ASU, GSU among other positions. So she is an avowed unionist soon. In the Department of Biological Sciences, she also became the botany coordinator of her senior roles of the Dame Botany Unit between 2016 to 2020. She was also the 400 level coordinator in the period between 2016 to 2017, Chairperson Ethics Review Committee in 2017, and Cyrus Coordinator of the Department of Biological Sciences between 2019 to 2020. In 2020, the Department of Biological Sciences underwent restructuring, and she emerged as the pioneer head of the Department of Botany a position she held between 2020 to 2024. She also served in various committees such as the Chairperson Promotion Committee, Member IBR Research Committee, and during her tenure as the head of department, she established a functional Hiberian, which stands at the best in Northeast Nigeria, 2020. Professor Alima Abba is also the current Chairperson, Environmental Sanitation and Ground Maintenance Committee of Bombay State University. On account of her scholarship, leadership, and community service, she was proclaimed a professor of botany in ecology and peace. moment as the first indigenous female professor in Gombe State University. She is also the first professor to deliver an inaugural lecture as reiterated by the chairman of the University Ceremonies Committee and PD Dean. From the Faculty of Science, Professor Halima has over 50 publications in local and international journals, book chapters, and books. As a mentor, <laughs> Professor Halima has supervised over 65 undergraduate projects, 30 master dissertations, and five PhD theses in botany. She has won the IBR of Tech Fund grant between 2020 and 2022. Beyond the academia, Professor Alima holds the traditional title of Magayajin Gwani, agenda of Yamal Tudeba Federal Constituency between 2015 to 2019. She is a recipient of the Award of Excellence from Gwani Development 2008. The late Professor Abdullah Himadi appreciated her hard work, commitment to service and dedication to duty with a hard seat. By implication, she is Hajia. She is a reviewer in various journals, an external examiner in several universities, including the Federal University of Kashiri and the Adamawa State University Movie. Community service. Professor Halima Abba has donated trees to numerous schools, such as the Apoka Tatari, Ali Polytechnic Bauchi, foundations such as the Zakat and Wakaf Foundation in Gombe State, and neighboring villages and towns within Gombe May I, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, invite her to profess on the occasion of our inaugural lecture. Thank you.
the Deputy Vice Chancellor's Administration and Academic, the Registrar, the University Librarian, the Bosa, visiting heads and representatives of other tertiary institutions, provosts, deans and directors, distinguished professors and other members of the University Senate, heads of departments, other academic, ad administrative and technical staff of the University, traditional title holders in our midst, and other district heads from Yamal to Deva. I thank you for sparing your time to come and attend this inaugural lecture. Women and children, distinguished invited guests, gentlemen and ladies of the, of the press, good evening to you all. Um, I am highly delighted, I thank the Almighty Allah for sparing our, li our lives to see this day. Having a, an opportunity like this to stand, to stand uh, audience and deliver an inaugural lecture, I would have loved to be given so many hours to be able to I have only 40 minutes. So please, I hope you will forgive me because I will have to summarize almost everything I intended to say. So however, and my subsequent specialization in plant physiology and ecology were shaped by a combination of personal interests, destiny and practical considerations. One cannot overlook the role destiny played in my educational practice as my decision to further my studies in education. of my degree in 1982 after successfully completing the remedial program. Navigating through the choices of specialization became a unique challenge. The logistical difficulties of traveling from Gombe to my degree, coupled with pressures from my in-laws, influenced my decision-making process. This like agriculture and medicine, despite meeting the requirements. I sought a course that could be completed in a motherhood. I found biology to be the subject I could grasp most easily. However, my aversion to certain aspects of biology, particularly animals like lizards, snakes, frogs, and chameleons, led me to opt for botany, the study of plants. The teaching style of Professor B. B. Gopal, an Indian lecturer, played a crucial role in shaping my understanding and appreciation of botany. My journey through academia was further complicated by the challenges of married life and parenting, with two children by the time of graduation. Despite this, I could navigate successfully without undue difficulty. Gratefully, I completed my studies and earned a BSc in botany without any carryover or repetition. The transition from student life to professional career occurred during my one-year national service course in Bauchi, where I was posted to teach biology in GSSS Bombay because it was the same location where my husband resided. On completion of the NYC program, I was posted as a permanent staff to the same GSSS Bombay later posted to GGSS Doma. This month, um, now I want to introduce plants because many people don't know what plants are. 
or don't understand what plants are. Plants are very important. They perform so many functions, such as photosynthesis. And photosynthesis means removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and releasing oxygen, hence improving the quality of our life. Taking us back memory lane, at the beginning of creation of the earth, there was no living thing in existence. Why? Because there was no oxygen. At that time, the only uh, gases that were present were methane, carbon dioxide, ammonia, and so on. Until gradually, the whole world now uses the oxygen which plants produce. Therefore, we have to appreciate that plants are very important to us. Detail. At this juncture, I would like to remind us that ignorantly, all we do today is cut down trees. If we keep cutting down these trees, don't we know that one day, if all the trees are not there, we don't have oxygen again, and all of us will be gone. So it's very important for us to know that we should not be cutting down trees. Instead, we should plant it. Another important function of plants are that they filter pollutants. Today, due to mass activities, there are we we secrete so many gases into the atmosphere, purifying it to release oxygen. Plants are also very important because they help prevent soil erosion. They stabilize the soil. Because whenever there is a soil, there is a plant, it holds the soil and prevents soil erosion. Plants also depend on pollinators, such as bees, butterflies, and birds. These are very important for pollination. If they don't pollinate our, our plants, the flowers, then food will not be produced. So if food is not produced, we are the plants. Then man from nowhere, I'm not talking in the angle of religion now. Man just dropped and found plants. In fact, he didn't know what to do with them at that time. So all he could do at that time is to wander into the forest. Because remember that even at that time, every other thing was there, animals and so on. So he goes into the forest, wander and kills those animals to survive. Gradually, until the uh, creation of fire, then he now realizes that he, he can now roast Gradually, uh, because it's a very long story. I'm only trying to summarize it. So gradually, as he kept wandering, the environment was very unstable. So now, he now decided to start domesticating plants. And it was as a result of domesticating these plants, when these animals get sick, he doesn't have the answer to give them. So the animals wander into the forest, then he will observe that they will eat this and that and they will get well. And that was how he now realized that there is medicine in these plants that he is living with. So this, the summary of how the history of uh, medicinal plants is. Then, plants are very important. We have a strong relationship between man and plants. It's very important in agriculture. Agriculture is the cornerstone of our existence. We cannot survive without agriculture. Depending on the different civilizations or the different uh, countries, like Asia, they depend mostly on rice. Here in Africa, we depend on maize, guinea corn, millet, and so on. So if these things are not there, we cannot survive only by eating meat. If you try it, try and just keep eating meat, you will just fall sick and you will not live long. But you can keep eating plants and you will live very long and healthy. So this is 
in a nutshell, the summary of my introduction of life. Then, um, the environment. We have so many challenges facing the environment. The first one I wanted to talk in detail on was deforestation. But now I will just summarize it. The relationship between deforestation and green solutions for a sustainable future is multifaceted. Deforestation contributes significantly to environmental degradation, biodiversity loss and climate change. We may ask ourselves, what is this deforestation? Deforestation is the increasing down of trees, and that is what we are doing. I don't blame us, it is due to poverty and many other reasons. I have uh, statistics uh, that shows the current status of deforestation from the world, Africa, and also including Nigeria. I think it is there in my manuscript. The second thing is climate change vulnerability. Climate change, we are hearing climate change planet. What is climate change? Climate change is the change in climate. They are caused by two major factors. We have natural factors and we have human factors. Natural factors include volcanic eruptions, changes in the solar uh, system, and melancholic cycles. So these are very, very slow. It takes millions of years before the effect is felt. But human activities, which is the second factor, is what has aggravated this issue of climate, climate change. And we are feeling it today. Now, the climate change is leading to increase in temperature. An increase in temperature is leading, is, uh, leading to change in the timing of the plant, of plant growth and changes in phenology. For example, because of this climate change, plants that are supposed to flower, let's say in February, are now flowering in March. I remember that there are specific insects that always come to pollinate these plants. So when they come and the timing has changed, they go away. By the time the, flower, the plant will produce the flower, they are not there to pollinate it. So that, that is causing a lot of problems leading to decrease in uh, fruit production because if there is no pollination, there will be no fruit production. I can give a very simple example. The first thing is around the corner. I went to the market to buy tamarindus indica, which is amia. The person was complaining that this year they did not have much of amia. They traveled as far as Taraba. Still they could not get. And somebody said, this is not something you can plant easily. Because it takes years for it to grow mature and produce these fruits. So the reason is simple. The timing of flowering has changed. These pollinators are not there to pollinate it, so you see the tree, but it will not have so much fruits. Then we have uh, changes in precipitation. When the precipitation is too low, then it leads to drought. Drought, we are experiencing it. Because something like last year, I remember that many people planted rice, but they did not get much yield. Why? Because when they planted the rice, at the time when the plant was uh, trying to produce the head, then the rain ceased. And by the time the rain came back, it was too late, and many farmers uh, lost. Then we have the third one, which is changes in extreme weather events. This include these changes in weather events leads to situations like hurricanes, typhoon, cyclones, extreme cold waves, heat waves, etc. We I have uh, many examples which the time will not permit, but one example under the hurricane is one type of hurricane that occurred in 2005. It's called Katrina 2005. It occurred in US, in North Orleans, and it was so devastating. It led to the death of over 1,800 people. 
and it destroyed many houses. And uh, just like I said, I would have taken time to list all those examples, but because of time, I will have to go to the next uh, issue. Now, sustainable agricultural practices. All sustainable agricultural practices are a major concern worldwide. The current global agricultural system is facing several problems, including soil degradation, deforestation, and unsustainable farming practices. Some of the unsustainable techniques used in modern agriculture include, include the use of excessive chemicals. Today, our farmers cannot grow rice without the use of fertilizer. Synthetic, I mean synthetic fertilizer. Those ones you buy in packs, urea, MPK, and so on. It's very dangerous. Then the, another unsustainable agriculture is monoculture crops. A condition where you plant just one crop throughout is very bad. It leads to soil, uh, it depletes the soil, leading to soil fertility. And excessive water usage and overproduction, which depletes soil fertility, and contribute to climate change. Another uh, environmental factor is waste management challenges. According to the report by World Bank 2018, waste management is a universal issue affecting every single person in the world. Poorly managed waste is contaminating the world's oceans, clogging drains, and causing flooding, transmitting diseases via breeding of vectors which increases respiratory problems through airborne particles from burning of waste and so on. So that is also uh, an issue. Uh, next one is urbanization pressures. Urbanization is a global phenomenon that has been transforming the way we live, work, travel, and build networks. As more people move into cities, there is an increased demand for resources like energy, water, and space which can strain ecosystems and contribute to environmental degradation. I have examples which I cited uh, related to Bombay. The study was conducted by Mbaya in 2019, where he also uh, talked about these issues. And subsequently, I think I also have many publications which I talked about the increase pressure on uh, increased demand on resources such as energy. Lack of environmental awareness and education. Increasing environmental awareness is crucial for fostering a societal shift towards green solutions and sustainable practices. According to UNESCO, education is essential for the sustainable and equitable use of biodiversity and its conservation. Lack of awareness of biodiversity and its importance is common because uh, with the biodiversity sometimes perceived as a resource to be exploited. That's what people think. They just think they can just go into the woodland, cut down any tree, and just get away. So there is really a great need for us, or for me and people in my field, to actually create awareness and educate the uh, population about such actions. In adequate conservation measures, here we are talking about lack of laws. Uh, I have talked about how this sector has been neglected by the government. So there is need for the government to actually uh, do a lot. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, Addressing this environmental threat in Nigeria in general, and Gombe State in particular, requires a holistic approach that integrates sustainable land management, conservation strategies, and community engagement. Collaborative efforts, including involving government agencies, local communities are needed. Sustainable development hinges on adopting green solutions that harmonize human activities with the resilience of the planet. In this endeavor, the critical roles of plant ecology, physiology, and medicinal plants emerge as cornerstones for crafting a sustainable future. Now, what is plant ecology? It is the scientific study of the relationship between plants and their environment. Plant ecology
psychologists seek to understand how plants adapt to their surroundings, how they influence their environment, and how these interactions impact the overall ecosystem. And some of the importance of ecology include biodiversity conservation, climate change mitigation, and erosion control. I made many contributions in that angle because my PhD research work titled Vegetation Structure, Vegetation Structure, Diversity and Life Forms in Relation to Soil Characteristics in Kanawa Forest Reserve, Gombe State, Nigeria. That's the title of my work. I worked extensively between 90, 2009 to 2011 at Kanawa Forest Reserve. And uh, I came out with five days and five papers emerged from there. If you go online, you see three species diversity in Kanawa Forest, shrub species diversity in Kanawa Forest, herbaceous species diversity in Kanawa Forest, soil physical chemical properties in Kanawa Forest uh, Reserve, soil as determinant of plant distribution. They are all there online. Now, it's not enough for us to just go into the field, sample and come out with results. It's very important to integrate GIS vegetation studies into our, uh, our work. And that was why I incorporated the GIS and then the aim was that we want to see the changes that are occurring within the forest. And uh, in Figure 1, we have the initial vegetation map between 1980 to 2020. The statistics is there, for example, grasslands uh, in 1980 had about 7.25%. If you, go, if you scroll through up to 2020, you see that it is reducing to 3.49. So uh, that's how that result is. But that was not enough. It was, that was the initial way the vegetation was. Now subjecting it to spatial analysis, it came out with the results of the vegetation changes uh, in the forest. And in table four, it shows as the changes that have occurred within the forest. Then um, the map, the chart in, on figure six is showing us the Kappa index. That is showing us how persistent the vegetation is between 1980 to 1990. And you can see the graph uh, at first, between 1990, uh, by 1980 to 1990, it was rising, it slightly decreased, and later on, it increased. And in, in figure 6, it's showing us all the vegetation types. And if you look at the uh, chart, you see that except for the one which is brown in color, signifying the grassland or thorny, it is the one that is uh, decreasing. And to project, this equation is now, you can use this equation to project. And it was, uh, we substituted, we, uh, substituted the uh, result into this uh, equation, and it came out with the finding that by 2030, this forest is going to keep increasing. So here, I would like to reiterate that in Gombe State, we have about 30 forest reserves. With the exception of this one in Canal Forest, all the other forests are almost gone because it's illegally, either illegally, the reserve. Uh, almost all of them are illegally reserved. We are still studying. I've almost finished studying the 30 forest reserve myself and my students. But this forest is the only one which shows that it is still increasing, except for some of the sites. And the reason could be probably because in that forest there is the police tree which is cutting across the forest. So also because I took the soil, uh, physical, uh, soil physical chemical analysis, it showed that it has a very high soil fertility. So these two reasons could be that with the police stream and the high soil fertility, that is why the forest is regenerating very fast. Except for those uh, parts, which is the Sudan and the grassland, which is depleting. And also, uh, 
the forest has now been fed. After my research, I think I recommended that the forest should be, should be fed because of too much anthropogenic activities. So today the forest is dead, and that also greatly reduced the pressures of the land. Another research was conducted in Wawazenge Forest Reserve. Two papers also emerged. Well, uh, one on herbaceous species diversity, the other one on tree species diversity. Then it was also subjected to GIS analysis, where now this is where you will clearly see what I was talking about. If we look at Hugo 8, you see uh, from the year 19, because the vegetation changes, is for it to tell us the changes that are occurring in the forest between 1975 to 2020. So if you look at the figure one, you see all the greenish parts signifies vegetation. But there are some parts inside that is showing non-vegetation effect of human activity. By the year 19, from that 1975, it was only one part, not reduction. But by the time it was 2020, it has reduced up to 46 percent. You can see that the greenish color is almost gone. So that is showing uh, the effect of deforestation. This table is also showing the uh, NDVI categories from 1975 to 2020. You can see it is reducing. Then the next chart is showing the net changes in land use from 1975 to 2020. And now, subjecting it to spatial analysis, the vegetation now, you can clearly see how the changes are. And when the project, when it was projected, that okay, now by the time, if all the factors remain, that is deforestation is not reduced, what will happen to the forest in 2030? You can see that in 2030, the forest is almost gone. That means it will change to be a desert. Is it what we want? Without trees, remember that we cannot control climate change. So it's really very important that the government sets forward to do something about that. Other studies also were conducted in other parts of Bombay State, including Pillery uh, and also Pilire and other parts of Gumbi, Balanga and so on. Then we also looked at another plant, which is of great interest to Gumbi State, called Azanza Garkena. What we were trying to look at is, why is it only growing in Tula? If you grow it, if you, you can plant the seed and grow it elsewhere. In some places, like in our botanical garden, it succeeded in growing, produces flower, but it will never produce fruit. The fruit will start producing, then it will fall. Then in other places, it will not even grow at all. Removing other factors like altitude, because there are many places that have higher altitudes. If it is rainfall, rainfall, there are many places that have higher rainfalls than Tula. So we now looked at the soil. The soil was subjected to some analysis, and it was observed that uh, under the soil, we have macro and micronutrients. The macronutrients, the rating scale showed very, very, very high macronutrients. That is not any special thing because many uh, areas or many places can, the soil can be uh, analyzed and then they will obtain very high macronutrients. But the answer we got lied in the micronutrients because the micronutrients, to our surprise, it was very, very high. And that included iron, zinc, uh, copper. Zinc especially is mostly deficient in most tropical soils all over the world. So now in Tula it's very, very high. So that may explain the reason why it may be one of the uh, elements it needs, which it cannot find in many other places. So we concluded that uh, uh, zinc could, the uh, high micronutrients could be the answer to the endemism of Tula, of uh, Azanza Garkena in Tula.
So then we have uh, some pictures which is showing the aerial view of the Sudan savanna. Sudan savanna is characterized by few trees and shrubs and grasses. So this picture, you can see how the trees are just dotted here and there. So this is the aerial view. We also conducted one round Gombe, and then this uh, plate two A, B, C, D is showing what was in there. This is how the vegetation is. Then uh, Kwami, Daraso Highway, this is how the vegetation is. Then Biliri, LGA, then Katungo, LGA, then uh, Shongo, and so on. So I think I will skip to plant physiology. Plant physiology is the study of how plants function, including their growth, development, and metabolic processes. It involves understanding how plants take up water and nutrients, photosynthesize, rest there, and interact with, with their environment. Um, under plant physiology, now I ask the question, how can plant physiology address environmental challenges? It can do that through carbon sequestration, bioremediation, and germination studies. Uh, my contributions there included in my MSc, I worked on morphological and anatomical adaptations of four plant species in the semi arid zone of Borno State, Nigeria. Now, out of this topic, two papers emerged. Uh, those papers were one, Acacia Senegal, and two, Farisabia and Vida. These are plants that have adapted successfully to any environment. And actually, they are the type of plant that we, be, we should be using for reforestation and reforestation. But because it's not beautiful, people don't like using it. But they are very, very important. Each of them, when you, you plant them on the farm, because it is leguminous in nature, on the, within their roots, it has root nodules. It has the ability to fix nitrogen from the soil, and so anything you grow under those trees will grow very well. That is why, uh, finally, in my recommendation, one of them is to incorporate agroforestry. If you are to do that, please use this plant for that. So I also work on processes in the flora to see how it is adapting successfully to arid environment. Then I now, having observed the researches I conducted under ecology, and in many of those vegetations, we observe the occurrence of invasive plants. Invasive plants are very, very dangerous to the environment. Why are they dangerous? Whenever they are introduced to the environment, they come along with them certain pests. This pest affects our crops, and they also indirectly affect us by uh, uh, certain vectors creating diseases. Sometimes they can even create outbreaks. So what are those examples of such pests? We have uh, desert locusts, which when it occurs, it can just eat up the whole for uh, your crop. Then we have uh, sorghum and maize stem borers, which suck the stem of most sorghum and stem, uh, uh, sorghum and maize. Then we have aphids, aphids platybora. It's very dangerous. I know every farmer knows what aphids are. If you plant maize and you don't spray it, next thing before you know it, it will eat up all the bees and you don't have any yield. So these are some of the consequences of introduction of invasive plants into our environment. Why this, this invasive plants? They have the ability to produce what we call allelopathic compounds. These allelopathic compounds, whenever the plant lets us say, uh, I am the plant, it will secrete the allelopathic compound. Then any native plant which is, which is around it, it will now kill the roots and prevent it from germinating and before you know it, the native plant will die. Now, remember that within the environment, we have insects. Insects know the native plants. So when you introduce these invasive plants, they don't know them. They will never come near these plants. Because 
the native blacks have been killed, they go away because they don't have home, no shelter. So when they go away, they wander and they die. And that is why we say it brings about loss of biodiversity. So this is, I can go on and on and on, but I think I should stop there. So these are the list of the plants that have conducted the ammunition studies and principally I, we conduct these researches and at the end of the experiment the students leave them in the garden and will help in donating and replanting in the ecosystems that are needed. Then I will talk to medicinal plants. Medicinal plants deeply rooted in historical and cultural practices have been essential to human health for centuries. They are found in diverse ecosystems. These plants have bioactive compounds, such as alkaloids, flavonoids, and terpenoids, known for their therapeutic properties. Traditional medicine, like Ayurveda and Chinese traditional medicine, they, in India and China, they rely on these traditional medicines for thousands of years. And uh, many of these plants, like Ayurveda, many of the plants could even be in form of spices, the spices we use to cook. I can keep listing the list of spices for you, and they all have medicinal uses. That is why I'm a lover of spices. So, <laughs> now, ethnobotanical survey were conducted. One, one was conducted in Bauchi, another one was also conducted in Wawazengi to see the unsustainable ways people are cutting down these medicinal plants. Because people rely so much on these medicinal plants, they cut it down unsustainably. For example, there is a plant, Terocarpus enhancing. In Hausa, we call it Manovia. If you find it today, it is almost gone. Because uh, for a while, the Chinese people came and they wanted to use it for furniture. So people ignorantly cut it down and they sold them. So now it is almost not there. In the Umwawa Zengia, when we saw it, you will hardly recognize it. The whole bark is uh, all cut down. Why? Because the bark is used whenever you are anemic. If today you are diagnosed to be anemic and you get the bark, either boil it or soak it in water and drink. I'm telling you, within three days, blood, you will, your blood will come back. It's very, very medicinal. So people have now been putting it down unsustainably. So what we are advocating is that, no, don't put it down. If you want to cut the stem, because the stem, there is the fuel where uh, the manufactured food travels from the stem to the roots. So when you just take us and cut it, you are cutting down the phloem, and in the end, the plant will die. So this, we also looked at it in canal forest, uh, in Wawazange forest, and uh, so I will jump to my conclusion, because I know maybe my time is almost up. <laughs> So let, let me give me some five minutes to uh, co to conclude. We have some challenges facing botany as a course, and some of the challenges include that of perception, image, and name stigma. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, this lecture concluded that the amalgamation of research. Imply ecology, physiology, and medicinal plants underscores the pivotal role that flora plays in shaping a sustainable future. From understanding intricate ecological interactions to unraveling physiological adaptations, our exploration has illuminated the intricate web of life that plants contribute. So I think I kept on talking and talking until I uh, concluded. I think it can be shown there. So I have some recommendations. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, this lecture on green solution for a sustainable future has provided recommendations as follows. One, rebranding the department. And I've given suggestions like plant science or plant science and biotechnology. 
uh, integrated curriculum design and introduction of innovative courses. Some innovative courses should also be included, like applied botany, environmental science, plant biotechnology, molecular ecology, and SEO botany. Uh, career pathway guidance and integration of plant knowledge in education. Uh, then, conservation back to my topic. My topic says green solutions for a sustainable future. So, where are the, what are those solutions? These solutions are that we should emphasize the conservation of diverse ecosystems, recognizing the irre irreplaceable role they play in maintaining biodiversity, implement restoration projects to revise degraded areas such as practical sustainable land management, practical ecosystem restoration initiatives, fostering the resilience of plant communities and supporting overall ecological balance. Then secondly, there is need to tackle the climate crisis. We must urgently address the climate emergency keeping fossil fuels in the ground. When we say fossil fuels, we are talking about petrol, biodiesel. They are what is scraping the ozone layer, leading to climate change, global warming, and so on. So transitioning to renewable energy sources like solar and wind energy and transitioning to electric vehicles. Because one of the causes of climate change is industrialization and transportation. So transitioning to electric vehicles and other alternatives to firewood, such as briquettes, promoting energy efficiency and supporting vulnerable communities are essential steps. The climate crisis affects not only the environment, but also food security and displacement of millions. Sustainable agricultural practices. Now we should advocate for the adoption of sustainable agricultural practices that prioritize ecological balance. Encourage, encourage practices such as the use of solar power for irrigation. I don't know whether that is done here in Gombe State, but in Ochi State, Jigawa State, they are now using solar to power their irrigation system. Developing climate resilient crop varieties through plant breeding and biotechnology. Now farmers complain that when they, they plant their crops, either the rain is too much or the rain is too small. I'm telling you, if you plant improved varieties that are produced by plant breeders, you will not have that problem. The crop will not care whether the rain is too much or too small, your crop will do very well. So we have to revert back to uh, use of resilient crop varieties through plant breeding and biotechnology. We should also incorporate agroecology, organic farming, and precision agriculture to minimize environmental impact, enhance soil health, and optimize uh, resource use. Waste reduction and recycling. The future of waste management lies in reducing and adopting innovative recycling technologies. This advancement can help us process waste more efficiently, recover valuable materials, and minimize environmental pollution. Then, green spaces and urban parks. Incorporating green spaces into urban areas improves air quality, provides recreational op opportunities, and enhances biodiversity. I think here in Gombe State, we are already practicing that. We don't have problems. All over, we have green spaces. And I'm telling you, the quality of our air is greatly uh, improved. Community engagement and participation. Involving residents in decision-making process foster a sense of ownership and encourages sustainable practices at the grassroots. Then the government must sustain plant conservation efforts to protect diversity and cop threats. Indiscriminate extraction should cease with such sanctions for violators. If legislation permits exploitation, immediate replacement and multiplications of affected species are crucial. Finally, we have to address the hindrance to plant resource conservation caused by inadequate policies and laws. And then, lastly, global afforestation. We have to embark on global afforestation, especially in northeastern Nigeria, including Congo. So today, I'm encouraging every adult to please plant trees. And when you are planting trees, don't plant invasive trees. Plant native trees. And I think 
uh, I have met some provisions of some seedlings to donate to few to people, anybody who cares. So it is, it's already there. So thank you very much, sir, for giving me this opportunity to stand before the university community to say something about voting. Even though, as I said earlier, I would have loved to keep on talking and talking and talking. Because I don't think I've had, except in the classroom, I've never had opportunity to stand before the general public to speak about voting. And I hope parents will encourage their, their children to study voting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Halil Mohammed Abba. Thank you very much. We have, yeah, we give her a round of applause, please. Can we give her a round of applause, please? Can we give her another round of applause? I think you are not doing it well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we are most grateful. We know you have so much to say, but time will not allow us to give you that time to say all that you have to say. Thank you for this. Uh, we thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this Professor Ali Mahapa, she has given her, she has given us her thought on what she thinks the world should be for a sustainable development, for a sustainable environment. Thank you once again. Please, another round of applause, please. Thank you, Prof. Please, you can take your seat, Prof. Uh, without taking much time, we will go to the next item of the program, which is uh, it's going to be a vote of thanks by the Vice Chancellor Administration, uh, Professor Adela de Umar. You are welcome. The Vice Chancellor, sir, uh, Professor Ali Usman El Lapati, Officer of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, members of the University Governance Council here present, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Academics, the Registrar, the University Bolsa, the University Librarian, uh, all visiting heads of institutions, our Royal Fathers, our um, royal fathers, our spiritual heads, temporal and, and spiritual, deans, head of departments, our honorable lecturer, Professor Alima Abba, distinguished uh, invited guests, staff and students, it's a great honor and pleasure to welcome all of you to attend this great lecture by Professor Halima Abba. First of all, I would like to thank our visionary Vice Chancellor for not only establishing this series of uh, special lectures, which includes the inaugural lecture, but also supporting it. In fact, that has put the university on the global academic pedestal. I would like to, that is among the great achievements of our Vice Chancellor. In fact, it has put the university on a greater height. For our speaker for today, actually you didn't have enough time to express what you intended to. But I can assure you that there are two take home messages. But before the take home messages, you are able to communicate biology from Neanderthal, medieval to current age of man, through uh, hunting and gathering to uh, agriculture. So we've learned a lot from what you have said, and the take home message is that we should leave meat alone and go back to plant vegetables and fruits if we want to live long. 
because nobody wants to die young. The second one is that we should avoid deforestation and unlawful tree felling because trees have the ability to sequester carbon dioxide and other uh, dangerous gases in the environment and it also enriches the oxygen gas that is available for plants and animals including man. Yes, the only forest that is fueling uh, the oxygen supply on the globe today is the amazing forest because most of the forests have been destroyed. So we take that as a telephone message. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor, staff and students of Gombe State University, I would like to thank all invited guests and all those who have spared the time to attend this lecture. I wish you a God mercy journey back to your destination. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, the DGC. Gradually, we are coming to the end of this program. Uh, however, before we, we round off the program, there are two things. First, I want to recognize the presence of Al Haji Ibrahim Mohammed Bello, uh, project, former project coordinator, DFAT, Yobe State. He is the husband to Professor Halima Abba. Apart from being an academic, he is also a family woman. You are welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, next, we are going to take the national anthem. Then, after the national anthem, the procession is going back in reverse order. The, the mayor, the VC, and other principal officers will go, followed by His Royal Highness. Then, others will follow them after. Thank you very much. Can we have the national anthem, please? Thank you. 